Welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm Harley Shaken, the chair of the Center for Latin American Studies. Uh, we're very pleased you're here and particularly pleased to be hosting this event. Uh, Venezuela is very much in the news, as we know, both with the death of Hugo Chavez, who was a defining figure for much of the last 14 years, and the upcoming election in Venezuela. The key of looking at the implications of a post-Chavez country, not simply for Venezuela, but for all of Latin America, is something that our speaker tonight will be addressing. Uh, there are many issues, uh, many ideas that I think are going to be important to explore. Uh, Javier Corrales is a professor of political science at Amherst College. He has written widely uh, on Venezuela, is often cited on Venezuela. He is on the editorial boards of Latin American Politics and Society and America's Quarterly. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Javier Corrales. to be here and um, when we planned this event, and this is absolutely true, we had no notion that we were going to be doing it right before the big election. Uh, so great timing, uh, but it wasn't intentional on our part. Uh, but if there's a place where I'd rather be uh, talking about uh, 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 the current events as I see them on Venezuela, I think this is perfect. Uh, you know, I, I, I know that uh, um, UC uh, has uh, very strong Latin American community of Latin, uh, uh, many Latin Americans and they take Latin America seriously. So to me this is a treat and I look forward to the conversation. I, as uh, 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 I was saying, I was, I'm a political scientist but uh, this is going to sound a little bit more of an analysis of the current uh, situation uh, meant to trigger some conversations, comments and discussion um, if there is interest. So I hope I leave time. I'll talk for about 35 minutes I hope. Uh, and, uh, and then we can uh, um, um, uh, begin having a conversation. All right, so uh, the title, uh, it's in Spanish, it's uh, Mas Duro Maduro in question mark, Harder Maduro. I wanted to uh, convey the idea of are we going to see if Maduro becomes president, as it seems that's going to be the case based on polls, although you never know, you never know, um, whether we're going to see a radicalization of the regime or a softening of the regime. I think that's what most uh, people are wondering at the moment. And, and uh, uh, not wanting to predict, I still want to say uh, uh, a few words about uh, how uh, I see this happening. And I'm going to divide my talk on, on these four uh, themes. Um, uh, the number 11, and I'm going to talk about this 11 point margin. Then I'm going to say something about uh, um, uh, the dysfunctional state in Venezuela. Uh, something about radicalization, and then I want to conclude a little bit with uh, international relations, U.S. Latin American relations in a post-Chavez Venezuela. So those are my four themes, and let me begin with the, uh, um, uh, this 11-point margin. Um, I think what's at stake in um, Sunday's election is not so much who's going to be the dominant force in Venezuela. I think Chavismo will continue to be the dominant force but whether Maduro is going to be able to hang on to the 11 point difference that Hugo Chavez obtained. This is an 11 point difference, you cannot really see it there, but, uh, 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 and um, this 11 point difference um, was perhaps one of the costliest electoral victories in Latin America considering how many resources the state devoted to ensuring this. Um, but, or Latin American standards have argued elsewhere that it's not such an impressive victory, and this is the, the data. Here you have all the elections in Latin America in which incumbent presidents have run for re-election. Now, only Chavez has run for the re-election uh, three times. In Latin America, we don't have that possibility, and presidents who have tried to go that way have been blocked. But the truth is that in Latin America, uh, there is an enormous incumbent advantage. And that Chavez, which is up there with, its, with this 11th point, had a pretty reduced victory 
for Latin American standards when you consider incumbent presidents running for re-election in Latin America. I mean, some of these numbers are absolutely remarkable. Argentina, Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner, very recently, 28 point, point difference. So, so it, 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 the, point, the issue is that, um, going back to this, um, um, there was a big upsurge in the Chavista vote uh, in 2012, but the trend was for closer elections. And so the key question is, what's gonna, what will Maduro deliver the 11 points? Here's the issue. This is what the opposition wants to be able to demonstrate. They want to be able to demonstrate that Maduro is not going to have an easy time hanging on to this 11 point. So for the opposition, anything lower than 11 points would be a considerable victory. And this is going to be also important for Chavistas, those who support Maduro in that they are going to be watching Maduro to see whether he is capable of using the political capital he has inherited from Chavez. And it could very well be, it could very well be that Maduro may not win by 11 points, maybe 9 points. And if that is the case, and this is, this is the crux of my argument, if that is the case, we're going to see for the first time a Chavismo that is going to be politically insecure. Since 2003, we have had a very confident um, Chavismo, Hugo Chavez, feeling that he can beat his enemies in a, in, in, at any time, uh, or at least that he had the magical powers to always prevail. But if for some reason this 11 point margin gets shrunk, um, we're going to see an insecure maneuver. And so, for political scientists, one question, one question is how this political insecurity will translate in terms of radicalization or moderation. Uh, one could argue that there are two competing theories here, uh, assuming that uh, the margin of victory is going to shrink. Who knows? But let's assume that that happens. Um, and we get an insecure successor to Chavez. Uh, one theory could say, look, uh, this will be a president that will want to be more accommodating to the opposition, more moderating. He knows that this campaign on radicalism didn't work out. So that's one possible expectation, one possible uh, 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 scenario. But one could argue instead that an insecure presidency might instead turn more autocratic. Um, if you've read some of my work on Venezuela, you may know that I've been arguing that this is a semi-democracy, a hybrid regime um, uh, with enormous examples of authoritarianism mixed in with democracy. And so there is room for, perhaps, this balance between democracy and authoritarianism begin to tilt in the direction of even further um, authoritarianism. This is what I think we are going to be able to watch. Political scientists have been studying Venezuela, and especially Chavez, because you know, the topics are so, so significant you know, uh, on two central issues for political scientists. What is the relationship between the state and the market, on the one hand, uh, and the other, uh, what is the uh, relationship uh, uh, between the executive branch and other branches of government and other actors? Um, uh, in Venezuela, what we have seen under Chavez is that the ruling party has taken a radical position on these issues, on the question of state relationship to the market, uh, a lot of statism, and on the question of uh, executive power. The argument is no checks on the power of the presidency. And, and you know we will have a lot of that to study, but what I'm saying is we now may have another set of uh, forces at play in Venezuela, which is what is going to happen with a version of Chavismo that's going to be a little bit more politically insecure. Of course, if he wins by a bigger margin, then none of what I'm saying matters. <laughs> okay, so let's move on um, to. Uh, a little bit about uh, uh, Venezuela as a petrostate and the Chavez years. This is a very familiar chart on the prices of oil. It is not based on the Venezuelan basket, but uh, it is based on uh, um, uh, 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 the uh, intermediate, West intermediate, Texas intermediate uh, 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 oil. And what I want you to notice is that for most of the 20th century, uh, oil prices were fairly stable. You see a big increase here. This is when Venezuela has its transition to democracy. And then you begin to see this volatility 
as well as huge uh, 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 increases. And, and, and you see two major oil crashes. Uh, this is the year 2000, Chavez comes in in 1999. You see this one, and then you have a big crash here, uh, uh, an increase in prices, and another huge crash. And Chavez takes office right around here after very serious crashes. But then this is Chavez's windfall. This is the most important thing that I have that I try to tell people. No Venezuelan president and no Latin American president has ever enjoyed this. And in Venezuela, the oil, the, the, the oil is basically, uh, the state is the monopoly owner of oil revenues. So not only are you getting a huge windfall, but unlike other uh, commodity exporters from Latin America, the most important owner of this commodity is the state. And so Chavez was able to take advantage of this and pretty much unilaterally use these resources um, to, to, to govern. And, and so uh, uh, we know some of the uh, uh, uses that he has made of, uh, uh, of this oil. But it is very important that you keep this in mind that when oil prices are this high, um, it matters to know that Venezuela is one of the few petro states. Um, this is an example of the extent to which Venezuela is a petro state. Um, these are levels of proven reserves. Um, Venezuela in 1990, this was uh, in 2006, was no doubt the most significant oil, uh, uh, had the most significant oil reserves. But they have become even larger now that um, um, uh, many oil experts have declared that the extra heavy crudes in the Orinoco Belt are extractable. Now Venezuela has far more reserves, not just in Canada, but even Saudi Arabia. And so it's important to keep this in mind because really on this question of export commodity, uh, export, export of commodities and the degree to which the state controls it. Venezuela in Latin America has no rivals. All right, so um, somebody has calculated how much money Venezuela has had and, uh, based on this boom. Uh, people have said it's the equivalent of $25,000 uh, $25, per capita for every Venezuelan, including uh, children, the whole population. So it's not an insignificant amount. All right, now. This is what is, I, let me now segue into the dysfunctional state. Um, there has been an enormous turnaround in the economic situation in Venezuela between October when Chavez got reelected and today. Uh, the economy is crashing. And it's important to understand this to connect it to my first point. We're not only going to see, the, we not only have the probability of an insecure Chavismo, but also facing the possibility of having to implement austerity. Chavismo since 2003 has been a movement dedicated to the administration of plentifulness. Now we're going to see, at least for a year, maybe a little longer, uh, uh, Chavismo facing the task of confronting the need for adjustments. Now, Venezuela is not Greece or Cyprus uh, about to go into financial ruin. It's very important that we understand that. But there's no question that for the first time we're going to start to see adjustments that run contrary to the type of policies uh, uh, that um, uh, Chavez has implemented. And this is important because anybody who has studied the politics of austerity know that they are very polemical. Nobody likes deciding where we're going to cut back and who's going to uh, um, bear the cost of adjustment. This is incredibly uh, uh, polemical issue in any system. And so Maduro is going to have to begin to make decisions. Uh, where are we going to cut the deficit? Are we going to devalue again? Are we going to send more money to Petro Caribe? What are we going to do with uh, 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 the fact that we're not able to generate um, uh, more loans? And so uh, it'll be a combination of an insecure Chavismo facing the, the, the possibility of um, uh, um, Austerity. Now, let me just comment very briefly on some of the problems, economic problems, that Venezuela is facing. And I'm going to start with some structural problems. All I want you to notice in this chart is the uh, uh, top uh, line, and that is the production of Venezuelan oil. Uh, Venez uh, Chavez comes in 
right around January, <coughs> oh, uh, January 1999, not a bad point. This is the upper line, the light gray. And what you see is a downward trend. Um, look, Venezuela cannot control the price of oil. That went up that high. But Venezuela can control its production. There's no question that this is a result of Chavez policy. So uh, uh, now that the price of oil may not be enough to pay all the bills, one of the issues that they're going to face is what are they going to do, if anything, to reverse this trend? It is now a long enough trend to allow us to say that this has something to do with the way that the sector is being managed. And by the way, the trend is not universal. There are many countries, including this one, uh, that are seeing rising productivity uh, 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 in their energy sectors. So this is going to be a big issue. Um, this is the second big issue. The second structural issue is uh, the deficit. Chavez was a little bit like Bush. Uh, he inherits a surplus right around 2005. He has a nice surplus in fiscal accounts. And by 2012, it's a deficit of about 16%. This is major. Absolutely mega. Um, Greece, Portugal, Spain, the countries in the Eurozone facing difficulties have a deficit of about 7 to 8 percent. Venezuela has doubled it despite the oil boom. And so, this is an example of um, lack of macroeconomic discipline. Um, and they have a problem now in dealing with this. They can no longer sustain this degree of. Uh, uh, um, uh, this, this, this type of deficit. So we're going to have to make a decision about this. So here's a deficit, and so one of the things that is happening is that um, uh, you are generating inflation in Venezuela, and inflation is probably one of the highest in the world. Um, for 1990 standards, the Venezuelan inflation of 24 to 28% is not that huge, but for today's standards, this is one of the highest. It's even higher today the Venezuelan inflation rate that it is in Zimbabwe, which was the country that everybody thought would never be able to contain its hyperinflation. Um, so this is a big issue, and they're going to have to face a decision as to what to do with inflation. And um, um, one of the problems, a typical aspect of the um, Chavez government, is that the solution to inflation is always more controls, price controls, exchange rate controls. Uh, even labor market controls. And so this has always been what they have always deployed when it comes to inflation. And in many ways, it does work. It represses uh, uh, some important indicators. But one of the things that it does is to produce scarcity. Uh, when you impose controls on the prices on an the economy, then suddenly the cost of production of a particular product might be too high. If you cannot raise your prices as a retailer, then you stop producing. So that is why Venezuela is having a major uh, uh, um, uh, situation of scarcity. In fact, the central bank of Venezuela, the central bank, uh, publishes an index of scarcity. Uh, and that index has gone up. Um, and it's, it's uh, widely recognized. And then the government is in a situation of, what do we do with this? Um, they could undo the controls, but they don't want to do that. What they do is they begin to blame the private sector. And so you get a very anti-business rhetoric, perhaps <coughs> the most radical anti-business rhetoric that the region has seen since the Cuban Revolution. Not even during the Sandinista years do we see a discourse and a set of policies that is very anti-business and very punitive of the private sector. You know, the private sector is acaparando, they're hoarding, they're not productive, they are just amassing profits and not being socially minded. And um, you enter into a cycle where these anti-business policies are producing the, this incredibly extravagant capital flight. Um, uh, so notice that if you are Chavista and your worldview is that some of the worst evils of the world are coming from market uh, actors, you can pretty much feel, yes, look, they're not producing, and they're taking their profits away, we need more control. 
But you can also imagine how there are those on the other side who say, excuse me, some of these policies that you're implementing are causing uh, 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 the situation of scarcity and capital flight that we're seeing. So, you know, the Chavistas have become more Chavistas in many ways. This is what is so interesting. When Chavez died, he had another uh, peak in his popularity. Uh, let me just show you these pictures, which are, um, you, know, uh, you know, this is a famous uh, uh, um, uh, um, person who uh, draws cartoons. And uh, this is what he did uh, on, on the death of Chavez, the sudden um, uh, increase in the stature of Hugo Chavez. Um, what has happened is, you know, Chavez during his last campaign was saying, I am the people, and therefore you cannot impose constraints on the people, you cannot impose constraints on me. And so uh, citizens responded, Chavistas responded, Yo soy Chavez. Uh, this was a huge slogan um, in the October election and, 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 to, and, and until today. Uh, here's a, an example of a, 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 a nice little girl wearing the Chavez fatigue. It says Chavez there. Uh, uh, <coughs> I don't know what exactly that says. Something like uh, in uh, uh, um, But uh, you know, it's there's a big there's it's Chavismo is living some kind of revival. But again, again, we are never going to see the glory days of Chavismo when Chavismo managed to have. 15 percent, 20 percent, uh, 15, 20 point difference over their adversary. The adversaries are feeling that we should never, ever have gone this route, and this is part of the explanation for the polarization. Now, Maduro um, has assumed this as his campaign slogan: "I am not Chavez, but I am his sign." And like I say. Um, as if this were a monarchy, or you know, he's talking in sort of like biblical terms. But one of the problems with this strategy, one of the problems with this strategy is that um, um, there's nothing wrong with uh, a successor campaigning on the question on the basis of continuity, right? We do this when we want to reelect candidates from the same party. We want some degree of continuity, but we tend to always observe candidates coming from incumbent parties who are starting their uh, 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 career or want to be elected into a new office to say there's continuity, but I also bring some level of change. Uh, you want to vote for me because on the big things that you care about, I can deliver, but also let me show that I can do some things new. And one reason they might do that is to be able to capture some new votes. And I'm afraid, I'm not sure that Maduro's campaign so closely aligned with I am Chavez, I am Chavez, I am Chavez, with very little discussion of in what ways he is a modification of Chavez, is able to expand the Chavista coalition. Uh, it might actually hurt him, since who can really believe the idea that Maduro is really Chavez? Um, so, so this could be a mistake. He's of course, he is of course capitalizing on the idea that Chavistas love Chavez, and many other folks do. And so this is the safest issue that I can campaign on, because of this issue of our devotion for Chavez, we really have no disagreements. Any other issue that I care to raise in this campaign will certainly be polemical among Chavistas, so let me pick the one issue that unites us. But, as I was saying, it doesn't expand the, 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 the Chavez vote. Now, I also want you to be mindful that while these policies have uh, generated a strong Chavismo, this could very well be the first time that a populist episode of Latin America concludes feeling politically uh, um, uh, strong. When Chavez died, this was a movement that wasn't feeling remorseful or experiencing infections or major divisions. There has been impressive unity to this day. Uh, it's important to know that there is an increase in protest in Venezuela. This is uh, an indicator of street protest by a very respectable, it used to be very left um, uh, uh, organization, um, uh, uh, and they still are. Um, they have been monitoring human rights abuses and citizens' rights and issues of security 
and issues of police abuse in Venezuela for, for many, many years, since 1990. And the trend is that this has been happening even during the boom years of Chavez. You're seeing a lot of uh, protests. So there's no question that you have the intensification of this polarization in Venezuela rather than an abatement of it. Um, and um, the next uh, government is going to have to deal with this. So here's another interesting picture from enemies of Maduro. It's, it's scary. You know, I look at this, and uh, this is from a, a newspaper. Uh, they're mocking the notion of uh, Maduro trying to campaign uh, as El Hijo de Chavez. And it, it reminded me of this. <laughs> Maybe not, right? I guess it depends on your taste uh, in men. <laughs> All right, anyway, uh, so radicalization. Uh, I think, my guess here, I'm being completely speculative, that because we're going to see an insecure Chavismo with these huge economic problems, that we face the possibility of more radicalization. Uh, that there's going to be an intensification of the policies and the discourse that we're seeing rather than an effort to be accommodating. And I could be proven wrong. But let me say why I think we're going to see this. And, and the reason is the institutional legacy of Hugo Chavez. In the press today, there has been a lot of discussion about the economic legacy of Chavez. In fact, the press is dominated by this basically a lot of op-eds on all these economic problems as well as many other economic problems. But I want to take five minutes, maybe 10 minutes, to talk a little bit about the authoritarian legacy that Chavez is going to leave behind. And I'm, it might sound a little tedious, but it's in the details where you can appreciate the details. It's in the details where you can appreciate the, uh, the, the extent to which this regime is bordering on uh, authoritarianism. I'm going to discuss eight laws, eight laws that already exist in Venezuela. They were duly approved, and they are part of uh, uh, the legal system of Venezuela that Maduro is um, inheriting. And I think these laws are going to become very tempting uh, for anyone facing some type of uh, political turmoil. So let's go through some of these laws. The first one. The 1999 constitution that Chavez approved has an explicit ban on public funding of parties. I don't know of any democracy that has this. In most democracies, we want to make sure that there is public funding for parties. This does not, it's constitutionally banned. And it started in 1999. Number two, the 2004 law for social responsibility basically says it was expanded in 2010 to include uh, uh, the internet uh, and electronic media, but basically it is illegal to transmit messages that foment anxiety in the public or disturb public order. Um, the the uh, uh, law number three, a reform of the right. I just cancel. I'm done with that. Um, this is a good one. The 2000 reform of the civil code basically says that it is illegal in Venezuela to be disrespectful of government officials. I'm quoting directly. Disrespectful. It's illegal to be disrespectful of government officials. The law of telecommunications, uh, I don't have the date for um, uh, its enactment, basically says that the government has the right to revoke the broadcasting concessions to private outlets if it considers that they, if, it is, if it considers that it is convenient for the interests of the nation or if public order and security demands it. So uh, uh, they have been using these laws uh, to, to uh, lessen the extent to which there's private, uh, non-state-sponsored uh, 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 media. Venezuela has had, under Chavez, four enabling laws. Basically, this is rule by decree. Two of them occurred during hard times but to occur during good times in 2007 and 2010. And basically, Chavez did whatever he wanted, and Chavistas were perfectly, perfectly at ease with it. 
you don't see the turmoil that you would see, for example, in Argentina, when Christina Fernandez de Kirchner tries to be a little bit more autocratic, you know, even the ruling party gets a little nervous. But what we see is this protocol in Venezuela of uh, certain, certain uh, uh, comfort uh, with uh, these enabling laws. Um, this is a good uh, group. Um, a lot has been said about Chavez's organization of, of communes, and there's a lot to be said in terms of the rise of participatory democracy. There are laws, there's a set of laws, uh, uh, and their names are Ley Orgánica del Poder Popular, Ley Orgánica de Planificación Pública y Popular, Ley Orgánica de Controloría Social, y Ley Orgánica de Comuna. And a lot of people are amazed at how great it is that they're empowering the citizens' communities. But these communities are being empowered more than mayors and governors and elected officials. And none of these laws talk about elections for um, uh, who's going to be running these comunas. And so these comunas are now highly institutionalized, very legal. Chavez actually wanted to give them constitutional ranking in 2007, and, and, and that effort was stopped. But these are now state-sponsored groups that have quite a bit of power to get organized and to use public monies. And um, they have been used, by uh, everybody who has studied them, they have been used to um, cultivate public opinion, to monitor the political attitudes of folks in, in, in poor neighborhoods. And look, I want to be able to say that, yes, there is a lot of new participation and non-traditional actors who welcome this. The truth of the matter is that these are not organisms that are embedded in notions of checks and balance, um, elections, uh, <coughs> competition for who's going to be running them. They are appendages of the state, and they have very little accountability to citizens who are not Chavistas or designated members of them. Uh, number seven, uh, the law for the defense of political sovereignty and national self-determination. Be very careful if you go to Venezuela, and you as a non-Venezuelan begin to say bad things about the government because this is illegal. It is illegal in Venezuela for foreigners to either fund defenders of human rights or to be critical of the government. Um, and finally, finally, um, the law for partial reform of political parties. I love this one. Those of you who might know me, my first book was on the relationship between the president and the ruling party. This is a law to establish authoritarianism within the ruling party. It is a law that bans members of a party, deputies in the National Assembly, legislators, for it bans them from voting against the party platform. So it's uh, an effort to try to um, uh, impose party discipline. So you know, I could I could do more. What is important to understand is that this is part of the Chavez legacy. It's not his only legacy. Uh, we can talk about uh, distribution, poverty alleviation, what he has done to inequality. But this is something that I don't think maybe, of you, maybe some of you have seen it. This is an authoritarian legacy that's there, uh, ready to be used. Maduro doesn't need new laws, doesn't need major changes, uh, doesn't need a cultural revolution to begin to use these uh, instruments. Also, listen to the statement by the current president of the Supreme Court. Um, this is the one who has been issuing all these rulings uh, ever since we have had this constitutional crisis when, when Chavez went to Cuba for his final operation. Um, she basically said in 2009, we cannot continue to think about separation of powers because that is a principle that weakens the state. Now, this coming from the Supreme Court. Now, uh, for those of us who think there is some value in the separation of power and checks and balance, um, it, it, this tells you um, what is the constitutional principle uh, 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 dominating Venezuela. It's not notions of liberal democracy. So this is the institutional legacy, and that's why I think it's going to be very tempting for Maduro to resort to that. And the key question is whether there are going to be enough checks. There are two possible checks that could arise. The first one being within the ruling party. And I think this could be a check. Um, 
On the second one, if the opposition wins big, the opposition could perhaps demonstrate that it is not uh, uh, a trivial force. Let me say something about checks in the ruling party. Remember the 11 point margin? Uh, in December of 2012, there was an election for governors. And Chavez was still around, though not presently in, uh, in, in, um, in Venezuela. He was in Cuba, but he had not died. And um, about 21 Chavista governors got elected. And 17 of them obtained victories of 11 points or higher. So I begin, I'm starting to see that many of these governors are going to be able to stand up to Maduro, because they're going to be able to say, I, too, was chosen by Chavez. They were all chosen by Chavez. <coughs> uh, but I also won by a bigger margin. I have a constituency. So we might, for the first time, begin to see some possible checks coming from the ruling party in ways that we never saw at any point when Chavez was governing Venezuela. And the question is, can, can an opposition movement that does so well electorally and yet has no institutional presence, check the power of the president. I don't know. This is what we're going to see. We're going to see whether, you know, a repeat of 2012 with the opposition winning 44%, one of the most impressive victories for any opposition in Latin America, but no institutional home, only two states, and a few seats in Congress. Can they do anything? And they stop. We'll see. Maybe, maybe there's something about operating in politics outside of institutions that the Venezuelan case from now on will prove. Uh, uh, um, um, we will have to see it now. Um, <coughs> I should be wrapping up, and uh, let me just uh, say something about um, quickly to conclude. Um, these are the members of ALBA. This is the ideological alliance that Chavez with uh, 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 the Castro brothers started. These are the members. Uh, these are tiny places. This, you know, is about 10% of the region's uh, GDP. It's not a globally or regionally weighty association. What I want you to notice is that in Latin America, I think Chavismo has peaked. Um, since 2008, <coughs> There have been 15 elections. In 2008 was the last time that there was an election in Latin America in which a candidate, kind of Chavista, not totally, kind of, you know, someone, that was Fernando Lugo in Paraguay, was elected to office. Since then, there have been 15 elections outside of ALBA members. I'm only counting elections outside of ALBA members. In not one of them, there has been a victory for another Chavista-like candidate. Um, Chavista candidates have either rebranded themselves, Ollanta Humala in Peru, or if they didn't rebrand themselves so well, say for example, Andres Lopez Obrador in Mexico, they have done even worse than they did the first time. So it seems, I mean, this is, this is not a trivial record. Uh, in 2005, 6, 7, 8, you know, the rise of the radical left, uh, but uh, maybe it's over in the rest of Latin America. And furthermore, Furthermore, if I had more time, I would develop this point. I'm beginning to see, this is the international relations part, that uh, outside of the ALBA countries, ALBA plus Argentina, outside of ALBA plus Argentina, um, the demand for more partnerships with the United States is rising again. You see it everywhere. Uh, 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 in Brazil, we're seeing uh, enormous collaboration with the United States on uh, at least uh, four issues on Iran, Bolivia, Libya, and on security, especially drug interdiction. Uh, the, the years of Lula fighting with Bush are over. In fact, what you see is a closer rapprochement with uh, the, the biggest power in South America. I don't know if you've ever seen this is a very polemical issue, but the point I want to make about this Trans-Pacific Partnership is an Obama initiative, uh, a trade initiative. It was started by Chile, and the Americans loved the idea. And the notion is to create a Trans-Pacific Partnership. These are the current members. Here are the Latin American members, <coughs> and those who have expressed interest in joining Colombia, Costa Rica, and Panama. So you have Brazil. You have this situation, um, and 
you have uh, uh, many other examples. So this is what I want to uh, conclude now. Yes, I expect trouble in Venezuela. I expect a turn toward more autocracy rather than less. Um, I get nervous about it. I'm worried about it. You might even think that I could be a little bit obsessed about it. But, but, the United States should not be worried about it. I think uh, uh, for the region, uh, from the point of view of Washington, things look better than they have since 1994 if one uh, believes that um, at some point Chavismo might have been a security threat for the United States. All right, let me stop right there. Thank you very much, and uh, now I want to hear from you. Thank you very much, and we have time for questions and brief comments. I'd ask people to keep their questions brief so we can have as many as possible. Uh, are there any questions? <coughs> yes. I noticed that you mentioned how there's a there has been a decrease, decrease in the inflation rate in Venezuela. I would like to know if you have any insight on how that might affect the suitcase, since if there was something that was in the mix just recently. Oh, the proposed currency for Venezuela, I think, for um, for Cuba, Venezuela, yeah, uh, right, right, yeah, and for Alba. Yes. Yeah, I don't think it's going anywhere. You know, I don't think, of, especially, especially considering uh, what's happening in Europe now. I think that idea is not going far. The key question is, if I may, uh, uh, move to the question I think is more complicated: is what is going to happen? to Venezuela's subsidies of petrochemical nations. Um, this is very polemical at the moment. There are some economists who say uh, this is a huge waste of money. Here, uh, Maduro has an opportunity to generate some savings. Uh, and some folks saying, well, the savings that you would generate by doing these cutbacks uh, are not that substantial. Why, why turn nasty to these uh, little countries? So there's a huge debate, and, and, um, and um, Cuba is absolutely nervous that indeed um, Venezuela is going to decide to adjust by ending the subsidy to Petrocaribe, of which Cuba is a very important member. And hence, hence their um, commitment to Maduro, uh, because he has pledged to deepen the alliance with uh, Cuba. Uh, and, and so this is one of the big uh, things uh, that everybody is paying attention to, what is going to happen to Venezuela's subsidy of petrochemical, which is substantial for, for global standards. Um, uh, this is not a small part of Venezuela's foreign policy. <laughs> yes? I have a question specifically about the slide that you had about the production of oil and its since, uh, uh, I can't remember when it was, 1990 or... Since, or since about 2000, um, since about 2001, okay. the, the decline in, in production. In production. Yeah. Um, I guess my question is regarding, it seems that like, if we're only looking at that exclusively, uh, it doesn't consider the, the whether there has been a rise in productivity in other areas, especially considering that um, such an important part of this development strategy is to diversify away from oil because Venezuelan dependence on oil has been such a prominent problem throughout since the 1940s. So can we look at that decrease in production in oil productivity only, like, is it fair to look at it by itself without contextualizing it within, like, an increase in productivity in other areas, particularly in small um, productive, productive capacity? Yes, absolutely. This is uh, uh, true. I was unfair in only showing that slide. If I had shown the slide on diversification and industrialization in Venezuela, you would be appalled. Because Venezuela has become a living example of uh, Dutch disease. I don't know if you're familiar with Dutch disease. An overvaluation of your exchange rate creates a problem in your uh, 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 your exports of um, that the most important commodity go up, imports come in, and so you have less diversification. Um, of your tradables. And this is what you have seen. Venezuela today is far more dependent on oil. Uh, private sector and non-oil exports have disappeared. 
Venezuela is next to Chile, the most important importer of everything that you can think of. Even uh, black beans from the Dominican Republic, which they swap for oil. So the answer is, there, Venezuela looks even worse. And, and there is plenty of data showing it. Um, uh, many people but I don't think Venezuela is an example of that. It's a great question, but uh, uh, the data is pretty um, uh, uh, indicting uh, on that. Yeah. Um, I have a question about your thoughts on the, on the Venezuelan military, in terms of Chavez being born of military background, uh, and obvious support from the military versus Maduro, who I believe is strictly civilian and, and what your thoughts are on that in terms of implementing more ra radicalism. The Chavista coalition, you're absolutely right, is a coalition, was a coalition of radical leftists and uh, the military. <coughs> and you're absolutely right, Maduro does not come from the military side of that coalition. So for something that was a natural for Chavez, because he was uh, trying to be popular as well as um, uh, military oriented, it'll be hard for Maduro to, to, um, to win that sector over. Let me say this. A lot of people argue that this controversy between Maduro and Cabello is a lot about this, you know, the civilian versus the, um, the military side. Who knows? Remarkably, the military has pledged to the Maduro campaign and degree of loyalty that nobody was expecting. So the first test, Maduro has passed very well. Uh, I would have to say that, now I'm not a military, it, it's a very um, hermetic part of the regime, um, uh, uh, state military relations, so I'm no expert, but the signs uh, show that they have talk about unity, 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 far more, and much more explicitly than before. But it could be fragile, Maduro may not know how to handle it, uh, the military might have discovered that this is necessary in order to not to be defeated, and who knows what's gonna happen. But you're absolutely right, Maduro is, in this radical civilian military coalition, very clearly identified with radical civilians, aligned with Cuba and, and Marxism. He was um, defending Cuba at the age of 14 in schools. I've heard um, biography, you know, short um, biographical op ed saying that he was getting in trouble with his priest uh, because he was saying great things about Cuba at the early age of 14, 13 years right. old. So and this never stopped. Um, so, but he's not a military guy. Yes. Uh, thank you a lot for the talk. Um, I had sort of three um, questions. Um, one was the economic sort of portrait of the sort of devastating crashing economy, which has been made repeatedly in Venezuela and has repeatedly been off in significant ways. I mean, there are undoubtedly some problems with the economy and issues like that, but I'm getting a lot of my analysis from Mark Weisbrot, and he has sort of consistently said, everyone's saying the economy is going to tank, and I don't believe it's going to happen. This is Mark Weisbrot, and he's been right over and over again against the naysayers. And so, that seems like an important perspective. Now, I haven't looked at the data since October, but the economy, every said it was going to tank up because it should have made a crash, and it recovered relatively quickly and relatively well. Um, so that's sort of, sort of one point. The second is about the role of the US, which didn't fit in in a different sense in the um, talk relating to the sort of band against uh, foreign sources. Is one thing the US did have some role in the 2002 coup that removed Chavez from power and certainly has a less than glorious history vis-a-vis -vis democratically elected governments in Latin America. So it seems like there's some reason to be suspicious of foreign funding of various um, parties and other institutions there. Um, and then the third point is the one about democracy, which I also agree that there are <coughs> certain issues in having a sort of Venezuela as a paradise view would be grossly false. Um, but on the other hand, Venezuelans have the second highest support for democracy in the region after Uruguay, as far as I remember the last data, which is dramatically different from the 1990s when support for democracy was crumbling in Venezuela. So there's this sort of disjuncture between the view of Chavez as this authoritarian demagogue and 
and the widespread support for most of the policies that have cut poverty, made Venezuela the most egalitarian country in the Americas, and had a lot of sort of support in a general sense for democracy. So would love to hear any thoughts about those. Okay. Um, um, the, I, 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 let me begin by saying that you're right that people have predicted the collapse of the Venezuelan economy and they have been proven wrong. And the reason is that the price of oil is what it is, and you saw the chart. To tank that ship requires major, major torpedoes. And so the question is not so much why it hasn't tanked, but is this the best that Venezuela could have done? That's what I think one uh, has to imagine. And if you look at some of the indicators of poverty alleviation, go to the HDI uh, Human Development Index by the UNDP, there's an improvement, but it's consonant with trends worldwide. You would have never guessed that Venezuela has enjoyed this great ride, or even that there was a revolution. Um, so the, 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 look, Brazil has had better results uh, in terms of poverty alleviation and inequality uh, reduction. They have occurred in Venezuela, so, so that's the question. Now, things have changed significantly since October, uh, not so much with the price of oil, but because of the level of indebtedness and the fiscal debt. <coughs> however, however, these have easy solutions, you're right. Uh, with the devaluation in Venezuela, you fix the fiscal situation somewhat. Uh, and by entering into loan agreements with the Chinese, you, you, you solve your, your financing needs. Um, it's important to, to, to understand what I'm trying to say. We're not seeing Greece or Cyprus here, um, but this is uh, now a government that does not, that's not living in, in an era of um, uh, unlimited resources. Um, the next question uh, was on uh, the support uh, uh, that Venezuelans always say that they feel that they live in a democracy. Look, this is absolutely true. We also see it in China. Um, uh, but the more, in other words, that citizens, despite the fact that they may not be living in a democracy, feel that they have their best democracy. Or citizens who are living in very uh, uh, um, uh, uh, clear democracies feel that they are living under very oppressive rule. So, so there is many times that disconnect between how people perceive their regime and what political sign, how political scientists write those regimes. But the truth of the matter is that this is the phenomenon of popularity of authoritarianism. It is a mistake to think that authoritarian politics are always going to be unpopular. I think the Venezuelan case is one more example in which presidents can get away with a fair degree of um, restrictions of liberties and generate popular support. Um, and this is an interesting question for psychologists and political scientists. Um, why that is? Why is it that, look, um, um, do Chavistas like the Chavez period because of what he did for poverty? Or do they like him because of what he did with the opposition? Is, is this support based on uh, the, soft, the good side of Chavez or his bad side? It's hard to tell methodologically because Chavez encompasses these two aspects of it. But you're absolutely right that it's a mistake to, 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 to think that all autocratic uh, offerings are going to be uh, 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 rejected by majorities. We see that um, it is the majority force in Venezuela to this day. And, and, um, uh, and that's, that's a, a topic for another discussion. Look, um, I would never want to live in a country that uh, designates that foreign funding for uh, democracy promotion is a big. I just would not want that. Uh, whether it's justified or not, I don't think that this is um, a sign of uh, pluralism. Uh, yes, you know there are many ways of dealing with the crisis of 2002. Right after that crisis, the United States became part of the Friends of Venezuela and things were good for a while. The Venezuelan government initially did not consider the United States to be behind it. Um, this is something that came afterwards, suggesting that there's some uh, revision. Uh, I have never seen evidence, and I have looked for it. Um, yes, the United States came close to supporting uh, uh, the Carmona government, but a conspiracy. Hmm. But the notion that you have to be fearful of foreign 
foreigners to move is not the country where I would like to, to live. It's, it's part of the issue. If you're comfortable with that, uh, uh, great. But uh, I think this is odd in a globalized world, in a, in a nation that basically sends so much oil and receives so many dollars from the United States to then have a policy like this one. I think it is meant mostly to check the prerogatives, not of the United States, but of the prerogatives of citizens. And that's why that, that, that policy, that law worries me. Yes. Uh, so, so it seems like you're not a big fan of uh, people <laughs> <laughs> uh, And so I guess the question I have for you is in this upcoming election, um, the Venezuelan opposition has been sort of notoriously in that in you know, sort of coming together interpretations on um, the behavior of the opposition, the recent behavior of the opposition. One of the reasons I'd like to show the slide showing the comparison with other elections is because <coughs> it debunks a little bit the idea that this has all been mistakes. Capriles is perhaps the most successful opposition force to any incumbent running for office that I have seen uh, outside of the Dominican Republic, but that was the era of Balaguer at the end. Uh, but other than that, uh, Capriles was able to, to achieve that. But the question is, how can um, an opposition group beat this petro state, this, this state uh, that has this institutional legacy and so many resources? I think they have done many correct things. They have been kind of moderate. They have tried to maintain unity. They have try to be discriminating in their criticisms. This is the more recent version, the Caprinas version. But and at the end of the day, they don't win. And I think what is going to happen is that they're going to go back to repeating some of the old mistakes. You're going to see the proverbial split between softliners and hardliners. And we started to see a little bit of that right after Chavez died. And I think uh, you're right that there's very little new that they can do because they have um, they have done many right things and it hasn't worked and now they're going to go back to some of their old um, bad habits and I foresee a division and that would be the end of this. You know, if you see, um, in fact, I, I'm pretty sure that Maduro is going to pursue a division uh, and, and provoke a, a more extremist wing to uh, um, uh, emerge. Um, so, and at the at that point, then the game is over. Uh, but they have come very far. I mean, this 11 point is not trivial, but you're right that um, it, it's frustrating for anybody who believes that there should be alternation in office because it hasn't been enough. So. I uh, have a couple of questions. Um, in terms of the opposition, is there anything at all left of the remnants of the old parties? Um, or, or, or not? And similarly, you know, Chavez major attack on the old union movement and and has been building an alternative to the movement. And I just wonder what your assessment of the new movement is, you know, sort of how it's been institutionalized, who's joined it, what it's like, and so forth. Um, surprisingly, AD, the traditional party, is not dead. Um, it is the largest, after after Justicia, after Capitalist Party, is probably the largest party still in place. But I don't think that we're ever going to see it do a sort of like PRI comeback type. But it's remarkable that it has survived, that there are some remnants out there. But I think, I think, uh, 
the famous um, cardiarchy of Venezuela is, is, is no longer a factor. Uh, in fact, um, Chavez and Maduro don't even talk about that. They don't talk about Tabuquesia. They don't uh, talk about um, never letting the Adejo Bellano forces come back. The need Williams, uh, look, um, he is, uh, the government strategy has been to expand parallel unions. Um, and they're very loyal. They are very um, uh, loyal for the reasons that uh, you have studied. Um, the levels of inducements and constraints are very uh, salient. Um, they um, are always in favor of more nationalizations, uh, and then their productivity declines, and they don't get punished when the productivity declines, so, so they're not exhibiting discontent. However, we're seeing uh, these protests uh, that are not uh, being carried out by uh, Chavista unions, but they are popular protests. So uh, we're seeing the polarization at the, at the union level. Um, many of these uh, Chavista unions are um, working in the state sector. There are very few Chavista unions in the private sector. And the private sector is kind of shrinking in Venezuela. So side is, time is on the side of the Chavista unions. I think with time, you're going to see a, a remapping. That's, that's as far as I can go. I wish I, uh, I could say more. Steve Elner might have a better answer than I, but uh, that's my, my, my impression. We have time just for one more question. Uh, that was a pretty surprising quote from the head of the Supreme Court. Uh, could you give a little context to what was happening there? Uh, it was from 2009. Um, My, I don't remember. I'm trying to, to, to think what that was. Um, I can't remember. I'm sorry that I, I don't know the context, uh, and I don't want to give you the, uh, of the wrong answer. Sorry. Anti thematic. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I'm surprised by your statement that uh, you would want to live in that country. I uh, we accepted the fact that the U.S. can intervene to land the endowment for democracy in any number of countries where we prohibit funding for the United States. Uh, the other thing regarding your interpretation of the prices that that is the major structural crisis, mainly because of the price of oil, both the the, the government of Chavez did well as the major crisis, the one that. Anybody who wants participates and does participate in the moves are not limited to Chavista. So I see them as an alternative at the grassroots level to more direct democracy and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and an opening to, uh, to, to not see the central government as a control of everything. This country is more grassroots. <coughs> so much banning foreigners, but the reason why it's banned, um, you're not supposed to criticize. 
uh, if you're going to have a ban on funding, foreign funding, let's not make it politically conditional. Number two, uh, let me just say briefly something about the Comunas. Um, I, I'm all in favor of alternative spaces, but most people who have studied these communas, and I'm talking about Kirk Hawkins and several of his colleagues, discuss that these are like-minded folks for the most part, and that they are very aligned with the state. And although there are no explicit restrictions for the centers to move in, uh, they just don't get populated. Uh, there are no mechanisms for entry. But they're, they're peer, uh, uh, pressure groups in many ways. So I think theoretically you're right. Uh, they are inspired by the idea that you want to open up the space to folks who haven't participated. But de facto, they have become bastions of the state. Um, and, and that, I think, is, um, is, is, is not correct. And on the, the point of Chavez's recovering from the previous crisis, look, all of Latin America did fairly well. In, um, um, uh, in 2008, and the reason is because um, they managed to continue to export, and the price of oil dropped significantly, but never to a, the low point. You saw that in the chart, and then it quickly recovered. So, so again, I'm not that impressed by the management of, of the economic boom, and given the price of oil, what it has been, and given that the Venezuelan state is the only receptor of uh, those dollar revenues. Um, so uh, it's, a, it's a government that has plenty of room for maneuvering and they have to take advantage of that. With that, uh, we are unfortunately just beginning the discussion, uh, but out of time. I want to thank once again Javier Canales for being with us and for really putting a lot of compelling ideas on the table that I very much look forward to discussing from all perspectives in the weeks and months uh, coming up. Venezuela is going through, I think, some enormously important times, and the implications of that go beyond Venezuela. So thank you, Javier.